welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Atif Saeed. I am an assistant professor of sociology at uh, UIC here. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited to be part of this. Uh, but first of all, I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, there's a group of organizers who have worked hard for this, uh, including the panelists and some invisible labor too. We have lots of invisible labor. Uh, so thanks to the organizers and to the panelists and uh, mostly to the Institute for the Humanities at UIC for hosting us. Um, our esteemed experts on Iran and our, my panel, the panelists, um, I'm here, my role is a moderator. The, our panelists, Professor Kafeh Ehsani, who, who is a professor of international relations at DePaul University. And Professor Norma uh, Claire Maruzzi, who is a professor of political science, um, at UIC sociology and gender and, and, gender and women's studies. Um, so before proceeding further, I would like to thank uh, a long list of institutions and departments that co-sponsored our event. Uh, so as overall, the, the, the event is co-sponsored by UIC and DePaul universities. Uh, the following are the list of the co-sponsors of the, our event. UIC Institute for the Humanities, Middle East and Muslim Societies Cluster, Women's Leadership and Resource Center, the Arab American Cultural Center, uh, Department of Sociology, Political Science, and Gender and Women's Studies. And from DePaul Universities, the Department of International Studies, Department of Women and Gender Studies, Department of Political Science and Islamic um, World Studies Program. As we know, we, we followed the ongoing events in Iran um, after the arrest of a moral police uh, of a young girl um, and it becoming an, an, a mass uprising led by women, but it's not a women's uprising and there's lots of interesting things um, to be said about that. And before proceeding with some questions I prepared for our, from my co-panelists, there's some technical terms in social movement and revolutions. Are we witnessing a, a revolution yet or it's not yet? So I'm, I'm, I'm here, I'm reading out loud um, a tweet from my friend and colleague, Muhammad Ali Kadivar, who's a sociologist, social movement about this is not a revolutionary situation yet. It's a technical term in revolution. Are we there yet? That's something we, we should discuss, but also why this is significant. Iran is a country that has rich history of revolutionary <coughs> events and episodes. Uh, Iran has been labeled as a rogue state from uh, Western superpowers. There's lots of thorny and important issues uh, about women and a theocratic, autocratic state in Iran. First, I'm reading the, the tweet from Ali uh, and then move on. So Ali was saying, what we should call the events in Iran? Is it a social movement, revolution, or what? So far, we are observing two things. A broad protest movement that demands the end of a state violence and subjugation of women's bodies and an end to the autocratic rule of Islamic Republic. We are also observing revolutionary episode as a large group of people are resorting to protest tactics to demand major change in the political regime. We are still not observing a revolutionary situation where contenders advance claims over state control. The number of protesters need to grow much bigger. Currently, we are seeing roughly tens of thousands. For a revolutionary situation in Iran, we need to see millions taking action. And revolutionary outcome happens when we see defections of regime mm -hmm. members, particularly defections or neut neut neutralizations of armed forces and control of state apparatuses <clears throat> by, revolution by the revolutionary coalition. We are still far from a revolutionary outcome in Iran. So maybe I have some subtle disagreements with Ali, but that's something uh, important to, to, to think about. And we will, 
uh, try to answer some of these questions with our panelists. My first question will, will be um, the role of women in these uprisings. Is it accurate to say that it's a women is uprising or it's an uprising led by women? And what's the significance of women's role in on, on, on these protests? Uh, maybe we'll start with Norma. Yes, yeah. that's great. I, I wanna thank everyone who's here both in the room today, um, everyone who's here on Zoom, and, and then just reiterate that this is a collaborative uh, pull together teaching from both DePaul and UIC. Uh, we thought that was really important. It means that it's been a little bit haphazard, uh, but again, lots of effort to do something fast. And, and that this is a teach-in. So we understand there are probably some people, again, in, in here in person here on Zoom, who've been following this very closely, who know lots about Iran. And there are probably some people who have sort of no idea about Iran, except some vague senses that that uh, Atev has just mentioned, and uh, but are interested to find out, yeah, there have been these images in the in, on media, social media, especially of young women cutting their hair, burning their scarves, what's going on? So this, try to hit a little bit of both ends of that, but Kinda I thought good. I wanted to, cover to begin with just what exactly, what this is about, right? Why did it start, how it started, and, and some of the bigger issues part of that, to be very specific. Um, I agree with with uh, with Ali uh, Kadibar and and with what uh, Atik mentioned that about that question is this a revolution that's like that's that's way too far. Let's just start by focusing on what's been going on and particularly um, this the case of Masa Amini, who's this a young woman. She lives in in Kurdistan. She's Iranian, but a, a kind of provincial province. Uh, she was in had come to visit Iran. Seems like possibly Tehran. she Tehran. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Right. She lives in Iran. She's Iranian, but she come to visit Tehran, the capital city, possibly to explore going to university there. She was with her brother. And apparently when they um, came out of the metro, she was arrested by the morality police and the morality police are a subset of the police. Their job is to enforce the uh, particularly to enforce hijab proper hijab. And in that sense, it's very, very important to emphasize from the beginning that the protests, this is these are not particularly protests by most people against hijab. They are protests against state-enforced mandatory hijab. In Iran, every woman, whether you're Iranian, whether you're a foreign visitor, whether you're Muslim, whether you're some other religion, whether you're no religion, once you get into Iranian airspace, they will announce that on the plane. And certainly once you come off the plane, you have to cover your hair and you have to wear a sort of modest covering over your clothing. Now, this law it actually as a state law was instituted a few years after the revolution in 1983. The revolution was 1979. There were massive protests in the street by women at the time against mandatory hijab but it was enforced. And early on in the early 80s, it was very sharply enforced, uh, that it was very conservative. It was expected that women would wear basically long coats in very dark colors, black. Olive was a sort of, olive green was a kind of a dramatic, you know, red color, but otherwise for the most part, black, gray, uh, thoroughly covering their hair and the enforcement was quite severe. But over the last 40 odd years, there's been a constant push and pull with the state and with social norms pushing back against what counts as proper hijab in Iran for the authorities. That usually isn't quite um, made explicit. So it's kind of, you know, depends. And over the periods when I was going back and forth for about 10 years doing research, one of the things that was noticeable every single time, what was acceptable hijab in the street had become much less. So colors got much brighter, the overcoat got much shorter and much tighter, hair started sticking out all over. And yes, every now and then there would be, there would be crackdowns, especially on young women, especially in the summer but they also became much less intense. And uh, this was kind of a social negotiation that was happening with society and with the state, a kind of constant pushing back of the role of autonomy over the body for women, despite the law. So that's really important to understand. This is mandatory state mandated hijab. And then there have been these morality police, but especially in the last number of years, they became a on their own because the ordinary police said, we don't wanna to have to deal with this. We have other things we have to be enforcing, right? Burglaries, 
car accidents, murders, you know, we have better stuff to be doing. We're not comfortable with this. So there is a, it's a special subset of the police. Uh, and that's been the case for a while, but it's also important to emphasize, so I'm kind of giving the background on this, on this particular arrest, that the current uh, uh, president of Iran, uh, Raisi, was elected in 2021. And one of the first things that the new government did, and this is a government that is very, very hardline. Basically, it was an election, but it was an extremely constrained and controlled election. Anyone who deviated from the absolute hardline loyalty to the Supreme Leader, et cetera, was not allowed to run. That included former presidents, sitting parliamentarians, leading experts, et cetera. They were simply not allowed to run. They were not, they were vetted and not accepted. So it was a very narrow group. And Ricey was elected. And one of the first things that he announced and the new government announced was they were really going to enforce a job, that this was the proper thing to do. And it's always been the symbol of the Islamic Republic. They were going to come back and you know get everybody sort of to properly Islamicize. So the enforcement became much harsher, uh, especially on young people. And this comes back to Masa Amini because all the reports are that she was actually wearing what would most Iranians, including often the morality police, would accept as, as acceptable hijab. She had an overcoat, her hair was covered, but she was arrested and she died in custody. The government claims that she had a heart attack. It's That's not trusted. Her body was not immediately released to her family. It's, it's fraught. It's a fraught situation. But she died in custody. And uh, it, it is clear to say that at this point, for most people, they don't trust the official account. Whether it's true or not, it's not trusted. I would say that for an American audience, the best way to understand why did this protest erupt now is something like the question of Black Lives Matter. Right? You've got a situation, an ongoing, built up frustration of arbitrary oh violence, by God. but at some point it just accumulates and there is a particular incident that sets things off. It's not unique, but it is the one that kind of galvanizes existing frustration. And I would say that's kind of what happened. And then quite quickly, they were Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. This is this is what happens in teaching, right? We're all a little bit too fast with with getting our stuff and our tech together. But sorry. Um, no, I hope people on Zoom were able to hear. So what I'm just saying is that, so this is this is a kind of, this is a longstanding frustration and the frustration is, and the protests are both directly directed against mandatory hijab. Um, sometimes the women protesters are taking off their hijab, cutting their hair. We've seen images of this burning their scarves. Sometimes they are wearing their scarves, right? It is a different kind of protest than just saying this is against hijab. And already research I did 15 years ago with young women university students, where some of them would identify that way. I'm religious, I believe in hijab. If I was outside this country, I think I would probably wear hijab, but I don't wanna wear it here because it isn't about my faith. It's about the state imposing it on me. So this notion of autonomy is extremely important. And then that ties in, and this is what I'll, I'll sort of um, close out with, with saying the larger picture, which is the role of women and hijab for women, you know, especially covering their hair, became deeply a symbol, was claimed by the state as a symbol of the Islamic Republic, even when it became really loose and kind of the letter of the law, but not the spirit. I mean, the scarf that was like this with hair in front, hair behind, this was like 10 years ago. Um, not now, it's much more severely imposed. But that also means that the pop popular protests, which are often the headlines are about the scarf, women, women, life, freedom, but they're also about a deep dissatisfaction with the role that the state has played and is playing. Uh, focus on the incompetence of the state, on the corruption of the state. There've been these huge corruption scandals uh, that there's environmental crises happening. And also I would wanna just say that Iran had a very bad pandemic. You know, it was one of the real um, places with a lot of percentage of fatalities, not just numbers, but percentage. Uh, it was also clear that even though they started rolling out vaccines, when vaccines became available, they were not accepting Moderna or Pfizer vaccines from the West. 
And the government was, well, there are problems, this, that, and the other thing. And it was very noticed by the population that as soon as the Raisi government was elected, suddenly Western vaccines came in, the more effective Western vaccines. So I think all of this adds up to a sense of real intense frustration by women, but much wider, that this is a state that hasn't been able to deliver basic quality of life and not just high level quality of life, but just like keep its people alive. Um, there are lots of tremendous problems, but there's a sense that uh, the state is putting all its energy into mandating whether or not women cover their hair and then people are dying for it. And that enough is enough. And, and so this has grown out of not only the question of women, the bo women's bodily autonomy, but also and freedom for the population, but this larger sense of intense frustration that is circulating around what, what the state itself has claimed since the revolution is the symbol of the revolution, the symbol of the Islamic Republic, women in headscarves. Um, so that's the kind of overview I hope that that provides some background. Thanks, Norma. Um, this was great. And um, before another question, just to analogy on example about uh, the the very the critical part about the bodily autonomy of women and the to think about the supreme court in the us or uh, in france or like forcing women to take off their hijab so it, it's a question about the state violence on women's bodies or and so forth that's it it's, it's a critical piece about the rule of the state and the mandatory um uh piece of of it are we witnessing another revolution? Uh, it's a big question, and it's uh, and it's uh, ingrained with history and thinking about 1979, the big revolution. There was some other revolution, mass uprisings in Iran, including in 2009. There was a mass protest against uh, fraud in the election and the entire movement with the slogan "Where is my vote?" and so forth. So it's easy to say that we are not a revolution yet, but there's lots of critical pieces uh, about that. Yeah. So are we witnessing or when when it is, can we say that it is the beginning of the regime change of the Islamic Republic in Iran? So Kafe? Yeah, I mean, I think I tend to agree with uh, Ali Kadibar that you quoted uh, at the beginning. I mean, who knows? I mean, we're here with, you know, internet has been cut in Iran, you know, it's filtered heavily. We're, what we're seeing is our like, selective pictures of protests that are quite widespread. I mean, in like more than 100 cities, 160 cities last I checked, and locality. So they're quite widespread. How wide are they? Uh, are they, you know, street protests or have they spread beyond the streets to workplaces uh, and so on and so forth? I mean, and, uh, you know, um, so that's an important question. I mean, I think that's something that you sociologists like to kind of formulate uh, scientifically. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, who cares? I mean, you know, the point is that it's a very, you know, I mean, like we label it as as this or that. Yes. I mean, I think a lot of protesters in Iran would like to say it's a, it's a revolution, but this is a complex, if you want to think of it politically, um, I think it's important to think, well, it's it's easy enough. It's not easy, but it's easy enough to bring down an order, but to what extent do you want to change it and what will come in its place becomes a huge question. I mean, okay, you know what you hate. Uh, it is a, you know, it is a despised regime by now, quite clear, at least by the protesters and a majority of the population, but what should replace it and who's going to decide what to replace it becomes a huge question. And the, the problems and the crises confronting uh, society, Iranian society, as well as in many other places. I mean, environmental, social, economic, political are so huge uh, that, you know, part of it is one has to wonder, well, you know, what kind of, you know, preparation, what kind of building blocks are in place? You know, what kind of negotiation will take place? Who will replace this regime? Should it be replaced? The second point about the revolutionary situation is that despite the tremendous violence that is kind of visited upon protesters in Iran at this point. I mean, uh, and this violence is is brutal, but it's quite, it's actually been quite selective. I mean, so in cities, larger cities where people are much more media savvy and there's much better coverage, like the capital Tehran, 
they're using uh, rubber bullets and you know paintball guns and you know like uh, pellets you know gun pellets and all that and beating people and mass arresting in smaller provincial cities there's outright shooting people you know so in the, you know in the provinces of Zahedan or Kurdistan or Kermanshah uh, minority uh, Sunnis you know religious minorities as well as ethnic minorities quite significant and very politicized they've just you know like a couple of weeks ago, like 10 days ago, in, in, in Zahedan, in the capital of Baluchistan, a province that um, borders Pakistan and Afghanistan, they outright shot 90 people uh, who were coming out of a you know, Friday prayer. Um, so, but despite this, I want to kind of emphasize that the level of violence that a militarized state can actually visit upon its population has nowhere been reached. I mean, they haven't really started- We're unmuted. Asking, you know, hundreds, hundreds and thousands of people out in the streets. What will happen then? I mean, will, you know, one of the first things that happens usually, and this has been interesting in the case of the protests in Iran is that usually, you know, when you have violence, uh, you know, police violence or shooting or, um, you know, attacks, the first thing that happens is that people who are more vulnerable basically kind of go back, get out, right? The space becomes masculinized. Right, you just have young men basically who can kind of fight, who have hot blooded, you know, testosterone, you know, like uh, anger and all that. You know, that's what mobilizes people. But women, young, younger people, older people, pensioners, you know, older women. I mean, like this is not a place for you to combat. I mean, if you're protesting peacefully uh, for whatever you're demanding politically, you know that you know when it becomes to violence, politics goes out. I mean, mm -hmm. violence is the negation of politics. We know. What if the state starts doing that? And to the extent that it has started, started doing it, what is remarkable mm -hmm. is that women have stayed in the public domain, in the streets. This is to, still about street politics. You know, they're fighting it out. Their you know, school children are coming out, uh, you know. So this is quite remarkable. I mean, how far will it go? We don't know, you know, what, what the dynamic is about. You know, we don't know yet, but what we can do is like, we can admire the courage but it's also important, especially because this is a teaching, is to kind of like start deciphering, okay, what is going on here? Especially if people don't know much about Iran. And I would say a lot of the Iranian diaspora doesn't know. I mean, like we all have our own opinions and strong opinions, but to what extent do we know the, the clips that we see on social media? You know, what happened before? How widespread are they? I mean, at night when you're seeing people come in and, you know, uh, you know, people burning their scarves or like protesting, how many are they? You know, what are, you know, are they being attacked or not? You know, how, the rest of the population, what are they doing? You know, it, it's quite selective what we see through social media. And I think it's important, especially for those of us who are outside and far away, not to kind of substitute what we expect or what we see, uh, you know, in these clips for actually the political dynamics that's unfolding. What will happen in the future is anybody's guess. But I wanna make two points here. I think it's important to realize that these events are not, are not a rupture. They're not, they're not a break, right? Street politics, street protests are kind of endemic part of a re political repertoire and political culture of modern era. Since 19, 1906, constitutional revolution, People have experienced, Iranian populations uh, have experienced coming out in the street, taking it over despite repression, confronting the state and demanding political change and actually kind of achieving it or nearly achieving it on several occasions, right? I mean, kind of think about the difference in political culture of a place like France, which has had a revolution in 1776, uh, you know, that's not so. 1789, yeah. uh, whatever. I, uh, but but you know, but like I think late 18th century. I mean, like you know, street. You know, still if you you know if there's discontent with labor, with students, with environmentalists, with gilets jaunes, you know, people come out in the street because that's become part of the political repertoire and political culture. The same is true in case of Iran, right? The oil nationalization movement in the 1950s, and especially the revolution in 1979. Iranians experience a whole year of mass strikes, you know, mass demonstrations being shot at by the, by the army uh, of the monarchy at that time, and then victoriously kind of bringing down a state and building another one in this place, right? So that experience of victory has become part of the political culture. So what you have, what, what I want to emphasize is that the 
even though it is scary, you know, like when helicopters come and shoot you or the police comes and attacks you, people keep coming back to the street to make demands and violence doesn't scare people, you know? And so when the war, Iran-Iraq war ended in 1988, the first thing that happened basically in its aftermath, a year or two aftermath is you started seeing wave upon wave of scattered but quite militant public protests that were, you know, repeatedly repressed brutally by the police, by the military, uh, by gendarmes, by uh, by secret service, and, and so on and so forth. It's, this started in Islam Shah in early 1990s against, you know, a movement of, you know, the, a small uh, town on the outskirts of Tehran where people were being evicted by the municipality and the state for kind of informal housing when Iran was kind of shifting to a neoliberal uh, economy. This was kind of like electrified society. And ever since then, you've had student movements, labor strikes, and so on and so forth, and massive public protests repeatedly. Just in the past six, seven years, we've had multiple mass movements for <clears throat> environmental crises, in, against corruption, uh, against, uh, you know, uh, uh, by students, by pensioners, by laborers of, of various kinds, but they have remained isolated but they have been quickly repressed quite massively and they remained isolated. What's happened in this case, which is kind of quite striking is that they did not remain isolated. And I think the fact that it was the outrage of women against not just one incident with Mahsa, I mean, as Norma said, okay, you know, this was, you know, this was a galvanizing moment. But the point is that the state had started to very openly and much more aggressively humiliate people, humiliate women, arrest them, then bring them, you know, like, you know, this was a major case, July of this year with the young woman, Sepida Rashno, that was uh, arrested in, in the Metro for poor hijab and she protested and then she was arrested, taken to prison, beaten up and then brought to television to confess that yes, I was wrong, I, you know, I had, uh, you know, and this outraged people, you know, the fact that now, you know, instead of ne the negotiation that Norman you know, I mean, women have been forced to wear the hijab, but they've been actually always present in public protests. They've always been at the center and the core of public activism in Iran, in the labor force, more than 50, 60% of the population in 2 million students, university students are women, graduates, yeah? But the, there's a structural inequality against women. You know, they much have a much less part in the labor force, you know, less than 20% of the, uh, employed labor force or women, whereas, you know, in terms of professional achievements and accomplishments, they're, you know, they're, they're actually far in advance of men. But despite these, you know, structural inequalities, there's been, you know, women have worn the hijab, they've resisted against it, they've negotiated with it, but this is kind of like the, the change that we started seeing with Raisi's election in, you know, and especially beginning this summer was something that people just couldn't take in. But this kind of fits in, you know, I, I don't want to go on too long, but let me just kind of conclude on this point that there's a long history and repertoire of public protests. Uh, there, there was clear, there's a clearly a turning point in terms of the, what people were willing to kind of accept, you know, with, with the case of Mahsa Amini, but it, it kind of, there was a long, uh, you know, experiences of other women protesting. So for example, you know, a couple of years ago in 2017, I believe, you know, a young woman went in middle of a street, took up her hijab in, she's known as the daughter of the uh, Revolution Street, a major thoroughfare in, in Tehran. She was arrested, but she became symbol, right? I mean, like, okay, we have, we've reached a point where we have to kind of resist uh, the, you know, and, and taking off the hijab and actually kind of saying, no, it should not be negotiated anymore. We should claim you know, our bodies and our presence in public, and this is a political act, this kind of entered the imaginary by an isolated act that, I mean, she went to prison, people got, you know, upset, but it just kind of was imprinted, you know, in, in people's awareness, but it became a public movement. What is really important uh, in this case is that contrary to labor strikes and student strikes and various isolated protests that keep happening, uh, you know, in Iran on a regular basis, this just kind of galvanized people. So it's not just a women's movement anymore, although women are clearly at the leadership at the core of it. 
but it's galvanized various other kind of this content and uh, anger at a system that is seen as uh, unjust, unequal, uh, corrupt, and quite repressive. Um, so you know that's you know that that is uh, it's important to kind of realize that this is not you know just didn't come out of the blue. People really you know there there's a lot of other struggles prior to this, uh, including isolated you know activists who kind of like put their bodies on the line and paid for it. Uh, but now we're seeing a much more widespread, uh, you know, movement that is kind of led by women, you know, in that sense. Thanks, Kafi. I will come back to the question of the, what's happening on the ground and what we see is not the compre complete or comprehensive picture. That's a very critical uh, part of our discussion and we should to, to take it into account. Uh, but I have a question for Norma and also Kafi can chime in. Um, Many observers here in, in the US and the world are really sympathetic and, and are experiencing solidarity. But also scholars and observers and activists are some expressed concerns that, uh, you know, it's becoming a movement that's reduced to hijab or uh, Western feminists uh, performing, cutting off their hairs in solidarity with Iranian women or something um, along these lines. Should be this a concern for us, like as um, scholars and activists and uh, humans are committed to um, women, life, freedom in Iran and the ongoing movement that's momentum that women are and youth are taking, like risking their lives and their bodies. Uh, should we say, forget about those? It's not about this. What, what can we do? So um, yeah, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that there, there's a lot of concern, sympathy, outside sympathy by, by people who are not that familiar with Iran or not directly connected. And at the same time, a sense of like, yeah, what, what? And then caution, which is always good. And so what we decided to do was have a teaching, right? Because I think, especially about other parts of the world, our own parts as well, but it's the first thing to do is ask questions and to try to find out things. So not just assume, well, I, I, this, this has got to be a Western plot, or this has got to be a liberal plot, or this has got to be an Islamic plot, or whatever the conspiracy theory that you favor happens to be. Um, I think that there, there's a lot going on, right? And part of the problem, of course, for Iran, and especially I think Americans always need to be aware of that, is that uh, uh, succeeding um, US governments have, have explicitly talked about regime change in Iran. At points, Iranians have been so frustrated with the different periods since the revolution that sometimes they said, yeah, come in after Iraq, that's next. And then Iranians can look sort of, I would say they like look to the right, look to the left, look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan and realize you don't want that, right? And, and I do a shorthand by saying um, you want to keep electricity, right? You want to keep basic, a basic functioning of the state and society. So, so it is important for your, for people outside to be aware that often a kind of um, local protest in Iran against the state often do get picked up by outside and American government interests to sort of push certain kind of agendas, which usually may be against the um, the repression of the Islamic Republic of the state, but are not particularly about empowering ordinary Iranians. And in that sense, Iranians are very aware historically that not only did the U.S. Uh, support the Shah, but was considered a problematic figure. But of course, they also, you I mean, now all the, the documents have been released that the England and the US, uh, you know, fomented the, the coup in 1953 to overthrow the democratically elected government and, and re bring back the Shah as an basically an absolute monarchy. So there's a, a, a strong historical sense as well as a sort of contemporary recent events sense of like, <laughs> we need to be able to do this ourselves. But there's also appreciation for solidarities. I think in that sense, it's very important for, for instance, feminists outside, speaking to that in terms of this as a, as a women's protest and women's bodies, to, to again, that's why I emphasize so much, this is not about hijab as right or wrong. This is about a protest against state mandated enforced hijab, which is why there are also religious women who are not are protesting without taking off their scarves. This is something else. And so appreciating that and supporting, um, those kinds of, of, and at the same time, allowing populations to have some determination of their own, that freedom 
to determine their own destinies, right? As problematic, as messy as that always is when it's an organic process. That's important. Um, I don't want to get too much into something like, right, what's hanging over the background of this locally in Iran, but also in terms of outside is, is sort of two things. These are larger questions, but but they do, they 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 partly are are supporting this. It's hard to say restraint, but it is restraint by the government, right? We've seen, I mean, in Egypt after right the Arab Spring, like they they then the, the military and all came and killed thousands of people who were protesting peacefully in public. Um Iran has always, the state, even at its most repressive, has been more restrained, and it is hoped that it will keep with that. One factor that is, is very clear is there's a kind of hiatus right now. The Supreme Leader Khamenei is quite old, his health is quite poor. This current government has very much coalesced around um, a, a loyalists around him. And, and I all, usually tell my students I don't like using the term patriarchy because it has very particular scientific scholarly reasons, but you can't just throw it around. It doesn't mean everything. Classic patriarchy is, you know, ruled by men, but it's also, it's hierarchies of both gender and age. And this clearly, in a, in a funny way, is, is in very recently, the Iranian state has really consolidated as patriarchy of, of old guys against younger guys, against women, and those who are not quite ancient, I mean, Raisi is not ancient, but are, are there because they're loyalists. So uh, at the same time, everybody's aware of what's gonna happen when Khamenei dies, right? If, the, if what's holding the state together is loyalty to the Supreme Leader, who's a life appointment, uh, what's gonna happen? And no one quite knows how that's gonna work. So that's one thing that's sort of holding everybody out and, and sort of related to that is the nuclear deal. Um, I will say something just personally, my opinion on this, but a lot of people might disagree with this. You know, the, the, the sanctions that the US imposed and right that, that there was a nuclear deal signed and then Trump arbitrarily pulled out of, President Trump. Uh, and so the Iranian state as well as the society are really wary now, like we signed something and then what, you know, how do we, how can we trust this? But it's also been that especially the heightened sanctions, sanctions always primarily undermine ordinary people in ordinary society. And they tend to lead to uh, what we would call a black economy. So not just black market, but those with connections, especially connections to elites and, and the underside of the state, security services become much more powerful in the economy. So sanctions, Western imposed and US led sanctions have really caused huge problems for ordinary Iranians. And anything that can go, not to reward this state by lifting sanctions, but sanctions hurt ordinary people. So to that extent, to make the situation less fraught, I would say um, you're not necessarily supporting ordinary people in Iran by advocating regime change or advocating, you know, tighten sanctions on this and that. They're already about as tight as they can be anywhere. But uh, if you are wondering what to do, I mean, I would say right now, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's trying to try to find out a little bit more about what's going on and don't just, tr just trust social media. We all know that, as Kaveh said, social media is partial, but we all also know that social media is intended as a platform everywhere to heighten emotion and to grab images, right? That's what it's about. It's not necessarily about stepping back and calmly thinking what all is going on. It's very much a sort of episodic platform. So, um, I mean, that's a vague kind of response, but I think it, it is hard to know what to do from outside except kind of try to inform yourself and um, pay attention and um, don't assume that and this is also sometimes true inside that like the latest protests, even though they're quite widespread, they're unique in that sense, and they are starting to incorporate labor strikes, uh, which is really important. There, it, everything is not a revolution, you know, and a revolution can be a very, very long process over decades and generations. Thanks, Lorna. Uh, speaking of uh, educating uh, ourselves, uh, we prepared the handout. It's not really a handout, but it's just a some basic references, um, um, some good articles that gives the background about the Protestant timeline and you, are, you can dig for more. Uh, so please take just one copy and a reminder to everybody, uh, those who did not have a chance to sign up in the sign up sheet, please do so. Um, Let me also just say to people on Zoom, we will try to make this, we'll post yes. it, we'll post we'll it post the handout. along with this is being recorded and we will post the recording as well. Yes. So that will be so maybe I can comment on the yes. question. Yes. So uh, let me make two comments here. Um, 
One is that um, the, the, the silence of the left uh, about events in Iran uh, is kind of deafening. I mean, you look at established uh, venues like, uh, I don't know, the Jacobin, a journal that I'm at, and part of our editors, uh, Norma has been uh, associated with Middle East Report, uh, very little, you know. Uh, so that, you know, that very few people have actually commented on, on the issue. And this goes back to 2009 when, with the Green Movement and the elections in Iran. Uh, because the ruling establishment in Iran has taken an anti-imperialist posture, it is basically the one state that is really standing up to the US at any cost, right? I mean, no negotiation, uh, you know, kind of like standing its ground, uh, anti-imperialism, you know, pro-Palestinian, pro, you know, uh, anti-colonial, et cetera, et cetera. And this has kind of mesmerized, has, has had a history of mesmerizing the left. I mean, you know, other established, venues like, uh, you know, Monthly Review, for example, you know, and others uh, sided with the Iranian repression, uh, the Iranian state's repression in 2009 of protesters who had voted, you know, for, for, for an election uh, and had their votes stolen and then were being kind of repressed, uh, you know, badly. And this doesn't speak well for, you know, this lack of knowledge, uh, and lack of support for genuine democratic movements doesn't speak well. You know, people, the, the left, uh, and anybody who believes in democracy, not the nominal democracy, liberal democracy, but, you know, genuine popular democracy and accountability of the state uh, should inform us themselves about what is happening in Iran because it's quite significant for that region uh, mm -hmm. and kind of support, uh, you know, people's movement. I mean, you know, we saw also this, we also saw this with the Arab uprisings, you know, the, uh, the, the Arab Spring, which in my opinion, I mean, when, you know, Obama administration supported the coup d'etat effectively in Egypt, uh, pretty much nobody spoke up because the ruling, the elected ruling party at that time was a Muslim Brotherhood and the, you know, Islamophobia here basically led to virtual silence and de facto support of a military coup d'etat and the kind of you know ruling order that we see throughout the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. You know the monarchies, the monarchies, and then these military establishments in in Egypt, in Algeria, and so on and so forth. Right? This is really problematic, you know, because every you know there's there is this kind of stereotype that uh, you know. Uh, Politics in the Middle East is always ruled by violence and Islam and oil money, and therefore nothing will change there. But we saw in the, in the past decade and a half, we've seen you know genuine wave after wave of democratic movements and uprisings, and they ended up not being supported uh, or kind of undermined effectively uh, by the West. So this is an important thing. Uh, is people need to inform themselves, and I'm so glad that we have such a great audience here. And you know, there's a lot of teachings about what is going on in Iran. That's one. Thing. Now, the Iranian regime has presented itself as being anti-imperialist. It says to the Iranian population that, look, this is not like we're not like Syria, we're not like Iraq, we're not like Afghanistan, we're not like Libya. You know, it's not chaos here. We don't have terrorism here. We don't have. Daesh and ISIS and so on and Al Qaeda and all that here, because we've we've fought you know extremism abroad, right? We're fighting it. We're fighting the you know uh, the, the, the 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 you know the, the, the enemy ISIS as well as the U.S. in all these other places. Therefore, we have peace at home, right? Uh, well, this has got what has this gotten people? I mean, you know, like one of the big uh, slogans of you know, protesters is that, you know, I, I won't repeat it in Persian, but basically it says, you know, like, why are you spending money and sending soldiers and killing people in Syria? You know, the problem is here at home. And the same thing with Iran's intervention, you know, military intervention and support of, you know, militant groups in, 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 in Lebanon and elsewhere, right? So for the Iranian population who are experiencing this, this foreign policy is not something that is widely supported by the majority of the people. And, you know, they feel it, you know, they feel it through the sanctions, they feel it through, you know, that like the kind of repression that has accompanied the sanctions and also this foreign policy, because any kind of objection has been kind of framed by the ruling establishment 
as you know as betrayal as being mem you know as being you know anybody who kind of objects ends up in prison uh, or is is fired from their work and and uh, and kind of repressed uh, by being called an agent of Israel and the US and all that. So basically any kind of expression, freedom of expression and genuine criticism um, is kind of denied. These democratic, basic political democratic rights are denied based on this claim of being anti-imperialist and also keeping the country safe. Well, the country is not safe, you know? Uh, it's not safe because they build buildings that collapse on people, you know? They, uh, you, they you know, the, you know the, there's profound corruption. You know, every day new, major figure in the establishment is caught with their hands in the till stealing millions of dollars and you know they're they're just kind of released the, the next day or end up in canada as uh, you know like heads of banks branches and so on and so forth so the sense of corruption incompetence and lack of representation is very profound now an important point about the dynamic the political dynamics of the islamic republic since the revolution, this was a regime that was dual in nature. It's a weird system. It has always been a weird system. It was a kind of a military theocracy on the one hand and a elected you know, representative republic, quite limited, but nonetheless representative republic on the other. It managed as a regime to actually resolve a lot of its major contradictions all the way up to 2009, right? So even when it lost the war with Iraq, even when the, its whole economy kind of collapsed, you know, at the end of the 1980s, when its leader, charismatic leader, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini died in 1989, it managed to actually kind of through factionalism and kind of management, internal management, and kind of opening some domains to public voice, you know, like, you know, the uh, parliament that was quite kind of restricted, but nonetheless, it was an elected parliament. Um, or a presidency, and then in, in 1999, by kind of opening up local council elections to local councils and municipal councils, where 200,000 people were kind of elected fairly freely, you know, I was a participant in that, uh, it kind of, it, it presented some representation and managed to kind of give multiple voices. And the height of this was the reformist movement that actually was elected that, you know, like the elected president, uh, Khatami discussed, you know, talked about, you know, the dialogue among civilizations instead of war of civilizations, you know, like, let's, you know, let's have dialogue with any, anybody, including the US, opened up the, the you know, domestic uh, political sphere, the, the, the press, and so on and so forth. And a lot of the democratic upsurge that we're seeing now actually kind of started, you know, that the credit doesn't go to reformists necessarily, you know, but it basically freed up a lot of you know, civil society to actually become quite active. Uh, labor activists and, you know, students and so on, and feminists in particular, environmentalists and so on and so forth, right? This negotiated autocracy has, was, has been systematically undermined since 2009 and the election, you know, the, the, the contested presidential elections. Now we have a system which is basically ruled completely by the, ruling theocrats and the military intelligence apparatus through sheer force, right? From past elections, we know people who voted for this segment have never been more than 10, 15% maximum of the electorate, right? I mean, like this has been through, you know, repeated elections, this pattern has been established. So you have a minority segment of population has, that has kind of come and monopolized all institutions that used to be somewhat represented. This means that while you have more than nominally, but much more than 40% inflation, that you have absolute 20% of a population of 80 million living in absolute poverty, that you have unemployment rates of 30, 40%, much higher for women, that you have millions of graduates you know, from universities coming and entering the job market, expecting some kind of a professional life and being you know, uh, on the one hand demeaned by the ruling establishment and on the other hand, having no hope of either emigrating or, you know, finding a job or living a life of dignity. Uh, you have a society that is kind of polarized into winners and losers, right? And because there's no opening, there's no voice in the political domain, you know, for it to represent itself and say, all right, you know, what kind of policies? 
you know, what should change? What kind of development we want? What is the future? You have a society that is locked in a sense of there being no future because it is, you know, the, 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 the avenues of change are completely blocked. Therefore, you can only fight. You know, you can fight or lose. You know, you can fight and win or lose. You have nothing else to lose. This is something, this is a verbalization that one hears repeatedly in a lot of these, you know, like messages on Twitter and, and, and social media that we have nothing to lose, you know? And the sad thing is that the same goes for the ruling establishment. I mean, these people in the military establishment that are kind of shooting people or in the police and so on and so forth, should the regime change, where, where can they go? I mean, you know, uh, even Ben Ali, the leader of uh, Tunisia, you know, could end up go to go to Saudi Arabia, but they're enemies with everybody, right? So there's there's nowhere to go. There's a desperation in a locked polity, which can has no place to kind of actually negotiate this situation. And this is a very dangerous, you know, it, it's a very dangerous formula, in my opinion, that has to be kind of thought. Of. So th this is that the. I know the delicate situation on the ground, which is we cannot see fully um, because of the lack of coverage and the lack of internet, proper internet uh, accessibility and so forth, is tied to delicate regional and international politics. And if we might, we, we can we, we describe it as a balance of hypocrisy, if you might, like regional powers, they hate Iran. You don't want a democratic Iran because Iran is a boogeyman for, for whatever. They want a Saudi Iranian rivalry. It's a sectarian whatever in the region, Sunni Shia or whatever. Uh, U.S. and superpowers hate Iran. They want a regime change, but they don't want democracy. At the same time, the regime, as you're rightly saying, using anti-imperialist discourse to justify repression, mm -hmm. but also de delicate on the ground because it's unprecedented repression. And it's a battle of bravery and determination on the ground. And uh, while this will go on for a while, we don't know, momentum is really critical. Keeping momentum is critical. There's lots of things at stake. And I, um, even we don't know fully the picture on the ground, I want us to, to talk more a little bit about what's happening on the ground, about these rumors about police defections or not. We know that's unprecedented repression. It's a balance of Depression and bravery, why we don't know the real picture. So it's really to give you an image, it's, it's really delicate. And this would not last without continuation. Luckily, there is a history of victory mindset, uh, bravery, history of revolutionary episodes, repertoire, cultural protest. So that can keep going, but uh, the idea about uh, police defections or not, Soldiers refusing to shoot. We don't know. We that you can you, tell us more about the discrepancy between the urban uh, and um, strategic killing in the urban areas or targeting vis-a-vis -vis some other areas where like direct killing or the rumors about worker strikes or the oil worker strikes or not. We have we were witnessing or seeing some scattered rumors and uh, or filming about lawyers marching and uh, so like. It's a big thing. So, so far it's a uprising led by women and youth, mostly, while there's some segments in populations are sympathetic, but it's not mass uprising. So all these delicate issues that can transform the events economically through joining of workers, socially through joining of uh, other segments of populations or splitting the coercive apparatus of some soldiers defected, we don't know. Uh, can you talk more about what's happening on the ground, even though we have, we don't have full picture? Maybe you can enlighten us. So your your work in political economy about the oil, how far this can take us? I mean, I was just thinking that maybe maybe I think it's good you respond to that, and then maybe we we, maybe yes. we can go to okay. um, Andy. Our colleague has been monitoring the chat. Uh, and some a few questions. So, so maybe sure there are questions. Yeah, yes. exactly. okay. I, you know, uh, these are good questions. I mean, I think it's too early uh, to say. You know, it's is. I mean, uh, Mir Hossein Mustavid, uh, 
presidential candidate in 2009 who's been under house arrest uh, actually issued a uh, declaration from house arrest uh, you know saying calling on the armed forces not to shoot on people and to side with the people because he said you're a representative of this population right and what is kind of disturbing to me is that you know his his intervention was basically ignored and you know there was a, i mean you know you, you saw a lot of comments that oh you know he's a he's passe you know why you know why would we care about you know these leaders i mean he's irrelevant I think when you have a kind of a fluid situation like this, where kind of people talk about the fact that this is a network movement, that there are no leaders. Um, and they kind of talk about leaders as kind of individual charismatic personalities, you know? Uh, to me, this is highly disturbing, you know? Because you need, I mean, first of all, leaders are not just individuals, you know? They have to represent organized groups, you know? you need. For social change, you need organization, you need institutions, you need political parties, you need trade unions, you know, you need, you know, because within these institutions, this is where you debate and say, all right, what, what should we do? You know, how do we mobilize people? How do we convince people? How do we, you know, where is the give and take that, you know, okay, all of us can speak with one voice instead of a cacophony of kind of uh, insults that you see on Twitter or social media, you know, why would you say somebody who's relevant who's been relevant that millions went to kind of voted for him you know 30 40 million vo people voted for him and why would you say he's irrelevant and kind of dismiss him you know instead of saying and defending that and say well fantastic you know let's get on board let's everybody get on board i mean this is the danger of politics through social media that is based on fragmentation it's based on individual kind of expression of outrage because you want to get more likes and you know it's 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 really easy and cheap, you know, to sit, you know, somewhere in, I don't know, Florida or DC and call for people to go and fight and, you know, uh, die and say, oh, you know, the regime change, you know, uh, it's just, to me, that's ludicrous, you know, and like that lack of realism that, well, you know, I mean, once you get shot at, you know, you realize that this is no joke. I mean, like, you know, that, so I have all the respect in the world for the bravery of people who are withstanding this. I have zero respect for people who kind of, opine and call for you know regime change and you know radicalization and dismissing anybody who kind of has kind of paid the price you know in Iran whether you agree with them or not in in exile in diaspora I mean that, this is ridiculous so this is the kind of politics that we're kind of dealing with and it's very cacophonous mm -hmm. and it's really important not to be kind of smitten by this you know so where will this lead? I don't know. I mean, you know, this is something that we have to see. And to me, the lack of actually leadership and organization is a big worry, not, not a good thing. I mean, okay, you can't, if there's an organization, the regime can go and arrest people. And, but if, if it's a network situation where everybody's kind of like coming out in the street, uh, they can't arrest, I mean, they arrest people, but you know, like it, it just continues, great. But where is it leading? I mean, it's one thing to say down with the Islamic Republic, death to the dictator. But to me, like, you know, death to the dictator, I mean, if you're kind of calling a regime to task for, for killing people, then, you know, like saying death to this and death to that, you know, like maybe call for, you know, like, a, I don't know, a truth and reconciliation or like punishment, legal punishment of people who've broken their own laws, you know? So the discourses that we're seeing as they become more and more violent and confrontational, uh, is is a problem, and the lack of leadership is 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 really important here, and it's it's kind of deafening. I mean, actually, you know, because what you need, I mean, Iran is, as I said, is is facing like many other places, is facing huge structural problems, right? Economic, social, environmental, and and so on and so forth, right? And you need political organizations and uh, institutions from you know trade unions to political parties that are non-existent because they've been smashed um, to actually take positions and articulate, okay, what should we do? These are the solutions that we're proposing. What should we do in protests? What should we do you know, about the press? What should we do about the, the, the legal structures and so on and so forth, right? You don't have this. It's just kind of like a, you know, like militant confrontationalism that becomes, uh, you know, the only, avenue for for people to take so it's a it's a to me it's a very risky situation and i'm hoping something will kind of evolve out of this that some kind of 
voice and organization will take root and become kind of more structurally established. But I do want to say something, and I'm sorry, I don't want to go on too long, but I do want to say something about, and this is my opinion, uh, but about, because we're in the US, you know, what can we do? I mean, I think, uh, I mean, you know, Norma said something, I, you know, I, here's what I want to say, that the only response that the US has had toward, you know, Iran and the Middle East, if you look at it, uh, toward any kind of uh, kind of tension with you know various either popular forces or states in the Middle East has been military. I mean, U.S. has had no strategy other than military confrontation, one way or another, right? I mean, like uh, you know, maybe not arms, but like undermining, allocating money for regime change, uh, sanctions, which are economic warfare and all that. This has been disastrous. I mean. Who knows, in two weeks, we're gonna have a Congress that is probably gonna be Republican, another, you know, mini Trumps kind of, you know, entering the political domain, right? And these sanctions, this kind of, you know, like having absolutely no political thought and no respect for actually genuine, you know, democratic movements in the region, uh, when they are present and when they're kind of active has kind of systematically undermined democracy in, throughout that particular region because it's so strategically important because of fossil fuels, right? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a region that is kind of reduced to Islam and oil, right? Americans need to break with this mindset, right? Why should there be sanctions? I mean, in, in what way are they helping anyone? Okay, military, okay, don't sell armaments. But the kind of financial sanctions that have been imposed on, on Iran, you know, from I did a long piece on, you know, in Merab, on Middle East Report, on the state of medication, you know? I have friends who are kind of in, you know, have music companies that had, you know, basically were doing groundbreaking uh, musical production that actually one of, you know, this friend of mine, an album that he produced won a Grammy in the US as a best, you know, album, right? He had one credit card and, you know, to kind of like do business with, you know, you know, sell his albums and CDs and, and so on and so forth. His business was basically closed off because of sanctions, right? Sanctions have not, have only helped the regime, have only helped, you know, the, the most backward segments of, of the ruling establishment and undermine the economic well-being of, of ordinary people, you know? And the logic is that if ordinary people really suffer, then they will rise up and overthrow the regime. Desperate, impoverished, pauperized people are desperate. They can't build an alternative polity, you know? I mean, like, you know, I, I don't understand this, this kind of logic that has ruled our foreign policy. So, you know, I, in terms of, you know, if, if something like this comes up, you know, uh, military confrontation and economic warfare are not a solution. Really pushing for defending human rights and showing solidarity and negotiating with this regime actually, because you negotiate with your enemy, you don't negotiate with your friends. I mean, okay, you know, those you, you're on the same wavelength. Um, is something that people should seriously consider when they're kind of electing people or, you know, kind of thinking about this region. So thank, we have about 10 minutes left. So uh, we will try to divide the time between two questions from Zoom and two questions from the audience. Uh, will we start with the Zoom first? Yeah, sure, so Andy, thanks. Yeah. So there have been several questions that come through the Zoom, but I'm just going to focus on two. Um, you responded to several of these already. So, but I think that one question that's come up is, you know, can you help us think about how to respond to arguments that solidarity with the uprisings is grounded in Islamophobia? Uh, people here, how do we how, how, how to respond to that argument that oh, your solidarity with the protest is really just grounded in uh, So that that's one point, and then the other one is. Some pushback on some of the framing that you guys have had, arguing that look, this isn't about the administration. The new government is no different from previous governments or administrations. Right? The, the regime is about the regime, how repressing is the supreme leader. Uh, gender oppression is systematic, it's not just about the current administration. Can you respond to that? So look, that's the Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, let me let me respond sort of both of them in some ways, which uh, if... uh excuse me, they, now people on here couldn't hear me. Uh, repeat that. Okay, so so the first the first uh, sort of and I think some of these are kind of collected questions from Zoom was um, how do you respond to the argument that that uh, supporting the protesters is just rooted in Islamophobia, 
And the second one was um, disagreeing with the framing that this is not just about Raisi and, and recent crackdowns, but it's the whole regime. It's always been like this. It's always been complete uh, gender apartheid, this sort of thing. So, so I would say with both of those, like, um, that's just the wrong way to look at it. And that's a really blank check and any complicated place, including in your own local politics, you should know better than that. So yes, some people are gonna be uh, supporting this uh, anti-hijab movement on the basis of, yeah, it's always terrible. It should be, hijab should be banned everywhere, right? That doesn't mean you can't support democratic people who are protesting about something else or protesting for freedom. So you have to be aware, yes, and be careful who your allies are in the US. Right. Some of the people in the US, the commentators, including the Iranian diaspora, have been sort of taking both of those positions. And that's a problem. Uh, but that doesn't mean you don't want to be maybe have your own sympathies and support for the protesters. And the second thing I would say is that I think that, um, yeah, people who say that it's always been like this and the Islamic Republic is essentially, you know, a an absolutely um totalitarian repressive against women is just haven't read their history, haven't just kept up with things and don't really know anything. And you can look at all sorts of things, including the fact that despite the fact, all right, I will just say one little thing, but I double check this because I've done work on this, like literacy rates. So the great modernizing Pahlavi Shah that was so supported in the West for you know supporting women and literacy rates. At the time of the revolution, the majority of Iranians were illiterate, and the literacy gap between men and women was enormous. The literacy gap, the gender gap, and that's always important about if everybody's illiterate and it's close to the same you know, percentage, everybody's in terrible shape. But actually at the time of the revolution under the Shah's policy, in fact, a slight majority of men were literate and about 70% of women were illiterate. And one of the first things that the Islamic Republic actually did was insist on mandatory schooling for boys and girls and immediately the literacy rate and the gen the literacy went started going up very quickly and the gender caps started going down very quickly. It's also true you can track things like age of marriage went up, was already starting to go up, went up, fertility rates went down. I mean, all sorts of indications about building a middle class society in which women are more supported through policies, including education, public health, actually really improved. I'm not saying that was it's a good thing that was accomplished. It doesn't mean the Islamic Republic was great. It does mean there's a huge difference between women are definitely legally second-class citizens, legally in the Islamic Republic. A lot of policies have actually, like education policies have actually been important. And then it does matter what, you can also say that the United States government, they're all the same, Republicans, Democrats, it's all the same. It doesn't matter, don't vote. And that's a lot of people think that from sometimes from progressive positions. At the same time, yeah, if I'm just looking in Iran, it really does make a difference whether or not um, you're, you sign you sign an, a treaty or you rip up a treaty, which happened between a Democratic Obama and Trump. It does make a difference. So if you want to just say it's all the same, you're not paying attention. Thanks. So we'll, we'll take two questions from the audience. I have a question here, and we don't want to hear them together. Yes, I'm then here to answer collectively. So. I think I wanted to like, comment about like, the first thing that you said, like, what should we do like, over here, like activists outside of Iran, etc. The point is that uh, we cannot do anything about Iran directly, but like in terms of what we can do over here, we have two ways. One is that to think about like the details and interests in Iran, which is important at the moment, very important. But the other way is that like to think about this like universal capacity that this slogan than the ideas that the woman freedom, woman life freedom has. And like what can we do with like all of these uprising of like white wing like states all around the globe? Or I guess like an example over here would be like the issue with like abortion and like uh low basic weight. Like what kind of stuff this thing can do on a global scale and then creating like a major probably like front to support Iran as well. So I mean I know it's it might be like a much, like a very, very long stretch, but I think this is something that we need to think about over here. Yeah. That like, I mean, whatever we're doing about like Iran aside, and we need to do that. Uh, what we need to think about is that like this has a very, very significant universal potential to kind of. Uh, Significance. Like it's, it, thanks. Yeah. it's it's inspiring that uh, women uprising in the most uh, dreadful conditions and autocratic 
state and so forth. Wanna, the second question or comment? Yeah, actually, we have a question. Yes. Uh, where do you see yourself in five years? Like, what do you want to do? Oh, so, well, two things. One is that the US and the UK both. Um, fomented the coup in 1963 and we have 53 sorry thank you 53 and those documents have been released now by both governments so we, we see that that they they actually they funded it they supported people and that was about overthrowing the Mossadegh, gov Mossadegh government and bringing the, the Pahlavi Shah sort of back in as definitely in charge of the country so that's that's an earlier history so those two governments, but they were both clearly involved with funding, with helping to organize, with supporting. That's that's that was regime change in in, in the past. In the past. No, nineteen fifty three. In the past, but starting um, when exactly is this? But over the last decades, a number of administrations have talked explicitly. The Bush administration talked explicitly about regime change in Iran, um, both publicly but also privately within within policy change. So there has been, there has been definitely high level, not just sort of like pundits, but in fact, government, our governments who've talked about that openly um, and that that's, it only complicates things, I think for, for popular support for actually democratic change on the ground, uh, because it's fairly clear that there is, if anything, there is not, it may be said that, but, um, both the history of regime change and just regime change, going in and changing somebody else's government is often problematic, let's just say. For if one government does it to another, right? As opposed to other support. I think I hope that comment gets cut. Yeah. Could I, could I just follow up yes. on the direct action thing? Um, so you said I respectfully disagree and think that uh, Americans definitely do have the ability to directly affect um, you know, politics involving Iran. And I think that a major way would be um, boycotting certain uh, companies uh, doing direct action in the form of like causing destruction. Um, and a good example, I think, is um, an organization called Palestine Action in the UK that um, basically people go to major weapons manufacturers that are providing all of these arms to the Israeli government and, and basically destroying these factories, which has had a major impact um, on the rights of Palestinian, Palestinian people. Um, but my question was, um, why don't we see that in America? And how can we, you know, actualize something like that? Can I change? Sure. Well, I, I, I... I would try, I'm, I'm a moderator, so I'm not really the expert in Iran, but maybe as a social movement scholar or revolutions, I mean, we cannot tell you in a teaching, we cannot tell people what to do. And it's difficult because it's, there's no story for can. action. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you can, yes, but it's, uh, I want to highlight what's <laughs> earlier, why we're not seeing it's implicit from the discussion. Why? Because there's lots of misunderstanding about Iran, you know, and we don't know. We assume that Iran is just the oil and terrorism and violence and women oppressed. We don't you know the rich culture of history of pro-democracy activism and freedom fighting and, and so forth. Um, and as uh, Kafe was saying that even the left, left is confused. The naive left was a hardliner left or ignorant or have a one dimensional understanding about anti-imperialist politics. Any regime that's anti-imperialism is anti-imperialist is good. That's what's also a problem in the Middle East. You are sympathizing with any regime that's anti-imperialism or deploy anti-imperialist discourse. That's why. But I want to go back to the point about while the momentum in the ground is what matters, while what's the fight for freedom on the ground, what really matters, transnational solidarity also matters. We don't want to miss, like you misunderstand the teaching that we, we let's wait and see we just, uh, our role is to elect our accountable leader in the US. We can do transnational solidarity action through learning, education, expressing whatever we can do to support the movement on the ground. You know, and many, many critical transnational feminists and others, and also the Indian, Iranian, Iranian diaspora 
are important to the movement. I, I'm reflecting on this as somebody who studied the Egyptian revolution, as somebody who's outside observing, but also witnessing the solidarity, that solidarity matters, but also went on the ground. So on the ground, the activism and the bravery and determinations, determination matters on the ground, but we can do, also people outside can do lots of things, education, learning, supporting, getting the tools out, you know, we can do lots of things. You don't have to do the direct action to this, this level if unless you are comfortable to. This is something we cannot tell you what, what people who are do protesting on uh, tear gas companies and support and so forth. So final words for the co-panelists. I, I just want to do a quick response, which is that the problem exactly with what you're describing, which those kinds of direct actions about Palestine is that US companies are not supplying there's a complete sanctions with doing business with Iran. Uh, so it's not US military companies. It's not US particularly uh, even tech companies, right? I mean, in fact, there was a period when ordinary Iranians were like, if you, they, Apple wasn't allowed to sell, if you, you know, credit cards are not allowed to be there. It's an, really, that that's what the sanctions are about. So it's not like going to a company and saying, I disagree with what you're doing. That, that isn't the case. That's why it's a little bit more complicated and harder to say in some ways. I just wanted to clarify that. Good. Thanks so much. Kevin? No, I, I don't have much to add. So thanks everybody for being here. And uh, we hope that uh, on behalf of myself and the organizers and uh, the big invisible labor of uh, organizing, um, we thank you and we hope that this is not be an end. And really, I personally, I gain bravery when I see images and I said, it's both depressing and heart-wrenching to see shooting and attacking women and kids and youth and innocent protesters, but at the same time brings, you know, you, you, you shiver from like these emotions about people are at the worst conditions protesting for justice, for freedom, for bodily autonomy. So, uh, so I hope this will, uh, we will see how it goes, but Hopefully this will not be the last session. Yes. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, you'll do another. Thanks, Darren.